Hello, and welcome to HMS Nelson. Now, HMS Nelson, 1876. Now, originally this came out on the 30th of September, and the video that's gone up has so many sound issues, it's beyond belief. I'm not sure why. It didn't. I've played it for on the computer, and it was fine on the computer, and I uploaded it to YouTube, and I checked it as it was uploading, and it seemed okay, and then by the time it seemed to have been processed and put up there, it's developed all sorts of issues. So, who knows why? But it's still an interesting class to do, because this class is often forgotten about. This class is the Royal Navy's attempt, and it's a very concerted attempt, to try to build flagships for distant stations in what we would call the armoured cruiser era, in my mind. Some call it the ironclad era, but it's sort of a little bit late. Um, the ironclad uh, era, da uh, technically, I suppose, in battleship terms, etc., is still going on, but they're now starting to use things other than iron. They're starting to develop whole sorts of ideas and if I'm going to call this, this period is sort of growing is the armor cruiser is coming into its own. And it's really a redevelopment of the cruiser doctrines that have, be, that have been around. Now, why is this class specifically interesting to me? Well, literally the Royal Navy builds HMS Shannon, which is their first armor cruiser. And if you go back to my year of the cruiser videos, you will see a nice video about her. And there's a videos about all sorts of other things as well. I, I I have one of the things I will say that's a joy of being an academic is you're from a very early point told it's always fine to revisit what you've done in the past and try and improve it or add something new, especially if you found out more information or you've put in more thinking. That's a rather useful methodology. I'm not sure whether it comes from my history background or my international relations background. Yes, I have both. Uh, there are some people who follow this channel who I think I haven't talked about it in a long time, so probably don't realise I'm not I'm not even technically a naval historian, I suppose, if you were going for the technical terminology of my PhD. I am a naval historian, because that's what I do by training, and I specialize in a naval area. But my PhD is War Studies, from King's College London. That's where I did my PhD. Before that, I did a Master's in International Conflict, which is a sub-branch of International Relations, and basically covers when international relations goes wrong. My bachelor's is in history. So, my history degree is my first degree. And it's my base degree for everything that came afterwards. But then I m moved off into international relations because I had to for my master's to, get, to go and do war studies in the, way, the area I wanted to do in war studies and what I wanted to do in war studies. I needed a quite expansive background because of what I specialize in. In terms of naval history, and this is one of the reasons I'm really attracted to these ships, in terms of current affairs, I don't just work in history. I work in current events. I do. I write articles in magazines like Warships International Fleet Review and all those sort of things. Um, but I also work as consultant occasionally. And I consult on current events and current affairs, which is why I'm sometimes very circumspect about what I say online, and sometimes I'm less so, because if I'm being paid to talk about it to someone, then I keep my mouth closed. If I'm not being paid, then I'll happily talk about it and share my expertise. So, my area of specialism in current affairs would be call loosely called conventional deterrence loosely called conventional deterrence. Um, usually from a naval perspective, but I do deal with other sections. So basically I deal with the point of trying to do conflict management, or what we tend to confirm under conflict management, where you're trying to prevent the conflict breaking out, where you've got all the seeds there, and you're desperately trying to keep the lid on that pan. That's where I tend to work, where I tend to offer advice. 
Um, it's an interesting area. But it's, again, it's, it's one of those things about academics is often misunderstood about us. Uh, in movies and, and sort of movies and popular culture, we are either people who can do everything. Science fiction is a good example of everything. Suddenly you've got this person who's a doctor in something, can do engineering, IT, computer programming, all sorts of things. You're sort of going, wow. Or very, 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 very narrow areas. My sister is a geotechnical civil engineer. That's her PhD. She is a chartered civil engineer. She is chartered with all sorts of things. She's amazingly qualified. Geotechnical civil engineering is basically any engineering involving the earth. Now, she will primarily do landslides, flood prevention, uh, stabilization, soil strengths, which includes tunnels and all sorts. And it's suddenly, you sort of go, hang on, she's doing that, which is a, those are fairly large areas, but that's actually, relatively speaking to the field of geotechnical civil engineering, quite a small area. So, both the social, uh, it's both right and wrong in a way, the media presentation. In my case, I'm a naval historian is what I would call, this is sorry myself as, because it's, it more easily covers what I do. Because usually I'm using naval history to try and explain current events, to try and ex in better inform people so they make better decisions today than necessarily made in the past, or make decisions which are better informed using the models of the past. So I'm a naval historian. But I'm also a conventional deterrence theorist and someone who works in that area and someone who specializes in that area of conflict management. And I find the two inform each other. The reading of naval history helps me be better in terms of analyzing current events, in terms of looking at them and going, well, hang on, that's had that similarity and that's had that similarity. That doesn't mean they're going to work out the same way. No, no two things ever repeat exactly. History never repeats, but it does rhyme. I know that's an old joke, but it's disturbingly true in that humans at their base point tend to make similar decisions from similar motivations. Just the level of technology means those motivations can change. And so this is where I come in. Which is worked really cool. Um, but that's also where I come from when I start discussing things and why I find it almost funny recently. It's, I've done some videos and people have gone, oh, you're, you're get an academic, think you're... Because you're good in one thing, you think you're good in another thing. And I was sort of going, actually, no. Um, that is still my thing. <laughs> it's still my area. Uh, I, I teach international relations quite often. I teach all sorts of things. Uh, I will teach realism. I will teach liberalism in international relations. I teach them both. I, more realistically, belong mostly to the realist school, broadly speaking in terms of my international relations theories and my work in that I like to deal with what does happen rather than what I hope is going to happen. Because at the base point I'm not as trust and not as trusting or not as believing in the good in a goodness of human nature as some of my colleagues. Which is to be honest fed into a video which came out recently was because I was annoyed with the way some people are presenting the realist school of international relations because they are quite so far out from what we actually discuss and from what is actually there. But why does this come into HMS Nelson? Why am I talking about this with HMS Nelson? Well, because HMS Nelson is a great example of realist international relations and internal relations because of what she's built to do. She's built to be a flagship on a distant station. She is built to be both the representative of British power imperial internally and British power imperial externally in a place far away from where British power actually resides. She is the embodiment of what Britain wants to project itself to the world as.
it's interesting. Shameless book plug, as always. There are more books hopefully coming soon. Um, with the issues over pay, uh, pay currently, it might delay the pictures, it might not. And it's the pictures which will hold up the next book. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's not the writing. The researching, the archives are lovely. The researching's great. It compiling a book, I would hate to do the research into just how many great books and great works are sitting on people's hard drives waiting for them to be able to afford the pictures necessary, the rights to the pictures necessary to publish a decent quality book. Because books do require pictures. I know there are some really good books out there, academic tomes, which have no pictures or diagrams in them at all. And they have really good writing, but they are dry as anything to read, and they're never going to get anyone other than people who are supremely interested in the topic and who really need to, to actually finish them, because they are that dry, because of lack of pictures. Humans are thinking creatures, and we require imagery. And... You don't require much, but you require some to be in order to picture something in your head and really understand it and really enjoy it and get to grips with it. And it's only if you're enjoying and getting grips with something that you're going to learn something and find it interesting. So, pictures, yeah. But here is HMS Nelson, an armoured cruiser. As you can see, fairly decent looking ship. Uh, you could look at her and go, well, hang on, is that does that look similar to Atreus Warrior? It does, but it also doesn't, in that they have modified the arrangements of the Armoured Citadel, haven't they? And it's not quite an Armoured Citadel, in that you have armour down at the waterline level, protecting the engine room, etc., and those spaces. That's sort of the idea of where you're going to get, eventually, your armoured deck, um, and your various sort of vessel cruisers of that line coming out, because of... Well, what do we need to protect to keep the ship afloat? We, we need the engine rooms, we need the engines functioning, and we need to make sure no water's getting into those areas, and then she'll stay afloat. Okay. Armoured deck will do. But, as you can see from her armament, it's spaced out to give her a good, solid broadside. So, you're still looking at a broadside engagement, and this was actually made looking at this and talking about this vessel kind of interesting for... Uh, this week when I was also looking at science fiction ships, because the number of them which use a broadside engagement pattern, you're sort of sitting going, yes, you really like the Age of Sail cinematography, don't you? <laughs> Not the actual reality of how to place weapons if you ha don't have the thing of s the whole mass, etc. to deal with. She has masts as well as engines, because, let's be honest, she's going to be on distant stations. She's going to go to Australia. Her sister, Northampton, is on the North American West Indies station, which is also considered a hazardous posting, and is also the flagship out there. These ships are deployed out there because they can deal with that, because they can be that long way away from home and sustain themselves, which is an important part of their capability, because, again, Imperial image. Imagine it if the British flagship breaks down. And needs to be held in. Yeah, that's that's not good. That's 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 going to be embarrassing. However, if she sails herself in rather than steaming in, oh, it's because the admiral likes to say uh, try the sails out every now and again. You know, think about his youth. Yes, it's the admiral thinking about his youth and his joy of sailing ships. It's not the ship engine is broken down at all. No, 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 no. It's the Admiral. He wants to sail. Mm-hmm. And the Admiral will go along with that. Because which is it better? To have an Admiral who still enjoys the idea of sailing when he can, when he doesn't need to, to look stylish and swish and just enjoy the ocean waves? Or a ship's air or his flagship's engine's broken? Which is better for his PR and which is better for his nation's PR? Now, thinking with that in mind, go back and read all the histories you have of various stations, if you've got picked them up, where admirals in the early ages sail and steam 
are reported as preferring to sail their ships and liking to bring them in under sail and canvas when they can. Yeah. Suddenly puts a whole different spin on that lovely, lovely PR exercise, doesn't it? But these were good ships. They were. They took a while to build. They really did. But they're good ships. And what's really interesting is that it's HMS Nelson, which is built entirely by Elder and Co. in Glasgow. And the Elder even make their engines. And Elder goes on to become Fairfield Shipbuilding. And they lay her down in November 1874. They launch her in November 1876. And she's completed in July 1880. She comes in at a cost of some region of 390,000. Um, there, that's according to the um, uh, the naval annual. Uh, Parks puts it at four hundred eleven thousand. Hmm, I think it. I think the real uh, realistic reason is because Parks is trying to include armament, and the three hundred ninety thousand does include armament. But considering the armament is four ten inch. Guns, eight nine inch guns, and six twenty pounders. I think those would cost more than twenty one thousand pounds, and I think also the differential on Northampton, her sister, which costs three hundred ninety five thousand, and according to the BNA and according to Parks four hundred fourteen thousand, suggesting it's gone down to gone down to roughly well. 19,000 um, I don't don't see that happening uh, entirely 40,000 for all those weapons well considering for the two of them 40,000 that would be 40,000 for 8 10 in pounds for 8 10 inch 16 9 inch and 12 20 pounder guns I did some rough calculating a while back when I was first putting this video together, so before the trip, before everything that happened recently in September. And I came to a figure for those weapon systems of roughly three times that. Now, that was not in, that was not including the possibility that the Royal Navy had some in stock. They could have had some in their yards and they would take them off to other ships. And decommissioning them. That is the twenty pounders classic example is quite possibly that. And the fact is also they the the figures available were not figures available from British orders. They were available from others in terms of how what they're saying to others. So A the Royal Navy's ordering greater volume and B the Royal Navy always has the Department of Naval Constructors who are obsessively annoying when it comes to costing in that if you try and cost them they are going to cause you trouble now there are some issues with procurement this period there is um, the fact that the ordnance board has a lot of say etc but again they're usually all ordering quite such a vast quantity and quite so often that for someone to try and gouge them, they have to make a really concerted effort, and they have to deal with the fact that there is quite a lot of competition. There's also the fact that the gun mountings, etc., they'll have come from the builders of the ships. And again, those builders of the ships could quite happily be competitors for the guns. They aren't in this case, but, um, well, they're interesting. Interesting enough, Northampton, which is built by Robert Napier and Sons, and the engine comes from John Penn and Sons. And John Penn and Sons is a very interesting company because it goes on to become Thames Ironworks Shipbuilding and Engineering Company. It goes on to become the engine manufacturing section for them. So, the engine for HMS Northampton is built in London, taken up to Glasgow. Both ships are built in Glasgow. Elder Company build their own engine for Nelson. Northampton 
Robert Napier and Sons ordered the engine from London. It gets taken up by barge. Well, when I say barge, by coastal, what's, what was called as coastal barge at that time, which... A fairly solid looking thing. A fairly solid looking thing. Not like necessarily the barges we see on the Thames today. I think more of a um, more of a a boat hull, if that makes sense. Although I haven't managed to find a picture of it, so I would be interested in looking at the picture of the engine going around. There is apparently a picture somewhere of that. Anyway, Northampton, despite the fact her engine had to you know circumnavigate at least part of the UK. She's laid down October 1874, so, well, 26th of October versus the 2nd of November, so, uh, you know, a few days before, let's say a week before HMS Nelson, she's launched in, on the 18th of November 1876, so she's actually launched 14 days later. But she's completed on the 7th of December 1878. Her hull cost less. Her hull did cost less. But her machinery, unsurprisingly considering its transport costs, costs more. And she herself ends up costing roughly five grand more than Nelson. Not bad, though, for the time. Both were supposed to be capable of 14 knots. And both looked fairly decent ships. Now, what's it like to be deployed onto the far side of the world? Well, it's kind of an interesting deployment for both of them. In the case of Northampton, she has far more engine issues than Nelson does. Because Northampton is designed with the really fanciest and latest technology at the time. Cylinders which could be adjusted in volume to optimize steam production. Basically, uh, the idea was that you could make, instead of having these great big cylinders that are fixed, you know, powering the engines, because they're inverted compound steam engines, which will evolve over time into, well, basically become expansion engines at various points, uh, at a certain point. It's a similar idea coming through. The idea was, hang on, no, 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 when we don't need to use the full range of we can reduce the cylinder, then we don't have to produce so much steam and trouble is, a fancy system like that, you can imagine, it leaks. So, Nelson achieved 14 knots. Northampton only achieved 13.17 knots. And the fact that someone made an effort of recording 13.17 shows just how hard they were trying to get to the speed. Northampton's completed earlier. She goes out to be at the West Indies Station upon commission. She commissions in 1879 and is there in the North, Hampton, uh, North America West Indies Station for the next seven years. She's then, well, assigned to the reserve, takes part in the annual training cruises, becomes a boys training ship in 1894, and is finally paid off in 1904 and scrapped in 1905. Nelson, well, Nelson has a different career. Now, she actually deployed to the Australia Station in 1881. She didn't become flagship there until 1885. You can ask why. Why did she take so long to become the flagship? Well, when she deployed out there, Commodore James Erskine, who would go on to become an admiral of the fleet, basically wasn't quite sure she was the suitable ship for him to have. And that he was a Commodore, and he knew the person coming after him was going to be a Rear Admiral. He knew that the station was going to be in promoted up in seniority, and he had other ships to go around, but also he was doing a lot of time ashore, so he never used her as his flagship. Despite actually coming out with her. However, the moment... The moment 
a Rear Admiral did come out. The first Rear Admiral to be deployed to the Australia Station. She was pushed straight into the front of things. Straight into all the things that were going on. What was she going to be doing? Well, Sir George Trian... Um, T-R-Y-O-N. Trion. Sometimes pronounced Trion by some. By some but Trion. Um, basically, he comes out there with one mission. One briefing from the British government. Use every trick in your frigating arsenal to get these Australian colonies to A, cooperate together, and B, preferably form a coherent Australian nation, and therefore form an Australia. Eventually, lay the groundwork that's going to produce an Australian squadron and eventually an Australian navy. And that is what he set about doing. Using every trick and every political manipulation in his arsenal. And he had a lot. He would spend pretty much three uh, to... Oh. Let's put it this way. He gets out there slightly before he takes post in November 1884. And he leaves slightly after he finishes his term in February 1887. So... It's broadly speaking, five, six, yeah, two and a half-ish years he's out there for. And the, this is what he has at his disposal, pretty much, as his persuasion power. He has ten oval boilers supplying two three-cylinder inverted compound steam engines. And, by the way, these are guns being loaded onto Northampton, not to Nelson. I, we don't have a picture of that. But the guns come separately. The armaments come separately. They're bought separately. The carriages supplied by the shipbuilder, the people who build the hull. The guns, separately. And yeah, you're talking about 7,500 ton ship. You're talking a broadside of pretty much three 20 pounders, four, eight, uh, four, nine, uh, four 9 inch and two 10 inch guns. And a Belt but between six and nine inches thick, and if we go back to the arm pattern, which came up earlier, he says, flicking through, you can pretty much guess where the thick armor is in is and where the less thick armor is. But she's designed to stop herself being raked from the front and raked from the uh, 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 raked from the stern. So from bow or stern, she's safe from raking. Uh, she has these positions which are protected for the guns. You can see them. And these, are, of course, are the four 10-inch guns, and these are the 9-inch guns. Now, he pretty much spends his entire time going around for going, let's have a dinner, let's have a discussion. Let's have a dinner. Let's have a discussion. It was not an easy time. It was not an easy time. The Australian colonies had grown important. Especially as they had been more and more finding good sources of food, good sources of water, and more and more threats growing up out there. But also they're now considered a protection part for India, for various other areas. That's the reason why originally the Australia squadron is set up under the East Indies station. This is part of the growing British defence development in a period. Now, Tyrion was pan-picked for this role. He was considered politically capable. He was considered a good, good thinker. And more importantly, he was considered a capable officer. Because the purpose the British wanted them, was they wanted the Australian colonies to finance a fast cruiser squadron in the region for both their defence and to protect wider British interests in the area. There are problems with this, though. The problems largely come down to the difference between the various colonies. There is the colony of Queensland, who have 
their particular issues. And they were particular issues. Now, he was helped in this. The ni very nice Russians managed to um, uh, create the Penja incident in Afghanistan. Um, P-A-N-J-D-E-H. Penja? Um, it's what I uh, Where the um, <clears throat> Russians decided to... Uh, attack the force of the Emirate of Af Afghanistan and suddenly it became potential that Russia might be a threat to Australia. There was a worry about it. New Zealand was particularly worried about this but also particularly distant and they felt that if there was going to be combined naval force that they should have part of the squadron continually based at Auckland. The reason they wanted a combined squadron was because well, Trion explained to them pretty much that uh, their individual squadrons would be easily chewed up. And only by a process of indemnity whereby all the colonies would together compensate anyone who for their lot of the stuff they lost involved in local defence. And had a combined squadron, would they actually have any strength? United we stand, divided we fall pretty much was the motto of the argument he was pushing forward. The initial proposal he made, while being based on this lovely 7,500 ton ship, was for them to acquire six Archer-class vessels of 1,800 tons, armed with 6-inch guns and a cost capable of 16 knots, and costing round, roughly £105,000 each plus eight 150-ton torpedo boats priced at roughly around £53,000 each. Now, these were his initial basis and not actually what he seemed to think necessary. He seemed to actually believe that if it had been necessary to go for such uh, ships, you would need a lot more. But he was realising that he needed also to be providing them with equipment which would allow for the development of a nascent force i.e. any force he supplied them with had to be able to grow, had to be able to develop, had to be able to become bigger and more capable. And so it needed to start somewhere. He was assisted in his arguments for needing something bigger and better, though, by the fact that the French started producing 19-knot cruisers. Eventually, I get... William Henry White to design five two and a half thousand ton cruisers, each capable of nineteen knots, and they will be sent to form the Australia Squadron. Now, after spending all this effort to get this all through and working with the New South Wales government to improve Navy and the Navy anchorages in Sydney Harbour, working with everyone, visiting Victoria, Queensland, visiting New Zealand, going everywhere he could. Some, I'm not sure who, but I think it was possibly the Foreign Office had a bright idea. They held a conference of colonial delegates in London in 1887 to discuss the Australian defence. And they didn't invite him. That is why he requests to be removed when he is removed. That is why Trion is removed and goes home early, doing closer to two years than a normal term of at least three years on post. This actually causes the Royal Navy to be scrambling around because the Royal Navy, they didn't even realise he hadn't been invited until it was too late and they also didn't get their own invite until it was too late. This was primer... Oh, uh, we're going to get involved. Uh, someone, uh, uh, someone in the colonial office going, yeah, we're going to hijack this and take this over and take the lead in this. And there were some really stupid suggestions. I mean, there was one idea which was instead of building cruisers, let's build a whole load of forts around Australia. 
In fact, the idea was to ring Australian Martello Towers. If anyone doesn't know what a Martello Tower is, it's a very solid structure, which is basically looks like a thimble, most of them. And on top of that is a gun. Usually a single gun, sometimes they were twin gun mounts. And, um, yeah. You stick those in on various beaches, a whole chain of them. I'm not sure why someone thought the possible... Uh, didn't, I don't think the person who suggested it realised the size of Australia. Because a conservative estimate, based on their own number of defences they were building around the UK in terms of Martello Towers, would be, suggest that you need to build somewhere in the region of three to 4,000. Lundis knows how you're going to supply them all with all the people. Also, I suppose you just put far less and you just secure the various cities with them and times of the you know coastal parts of the cities in which case all the enemy has to do is land elsewhere and march up now admittedly i must admit in australia that's a scary prospect because the wildlife is really really scary but once you're not covering everything you're, there are lots of places you can theoretically land on Australia and do that from. It's far easier to have a squadron going around, far safer to have a squadron going around of ships, especially in this period. In terms of the British perspective on him, and especially the Admiralty, they felt he did more to provide a combined framework and build a methodology of discussion and problem solving between the colonies than any other person had prior to him. I think that's possibly where the problems come from because I have this suspicion that the reason he wasn't invited was because the colonial office felt he'd stepped on their toes. Because they were supposed to be the ones coordinating the colonies. And he had used his ship, its travelling status as a flagship, its, you know, its facilities for entertainment, for diplomacy, to go around the colonies and do a, well... You could say it's very similar to shuttle diplomacy. Who's going to... The, the, the Admiral of the station's turning up and he's invited to you to an intimate dinner for you and the other 20 most important people in your colony. Who is going to turn that down? His flagship is there in the water. It looks grand. It's got all this crew smartly dressed turned out. There are proper naval sailors coming to collect you from the shore in their boat and they take you to the ship and it's, it's going to be... So of course you're going to turn up. And then you hear this very eloquent, very engaging admiral talking to you about the needs of security and defence. Of how, yes, but the trouble is, any once they have a foothold, the Germans are in Papua New Guinea, the French are there, there are all these issues. We ourselves in this flagship have been going up and down the straits, dealing with convicts who keep escaping from the French penal colony, etc. It's, it's, there's so much effort. You need, you need ships. And the trouble is they can't be singular located because the problems change. You need to have to move them around and group them together. Really make use of all the infrastructure you have, you know. And you listen to him, and you hear all these wonderful words and this fine ship, this powerful looking vessel. It's clean, but yet so bristling with technology. Vessel. Is it any wonder people who were firmly opposed to the idea would, after dinner, become ardent supporters of it. After all, I am not a politician. I am merely an admiral. You can hear it now. So I speak to you just as what makes sense as a naval man, a simple naval man. And honestly, 
whilst I respect and you no, know, I, I laud the independence of X Y Z Australian colony. Doesn't really matter which one is. From a defensive perspective, you are one island. You are one space. You need to be able to protect yourself. And from a naval perspective, we can't dominate you. A navy can't tell you, it can't force you to do things. We're not going to stomp your houses, etc., or things like that. No, a, a Royal Navy squadron supported by the colonies to guarantee our presence out here and utilize and grow local talent and local knowledge for defense of Australia. That is, that is for all the colonies. That is the best deal, the most economic deal, and the most sensible deal, because you can maybe afford two ships on your own. How's that going to hold off an enemy squadron? But as a group, you can afford five, six, maybe torpedo boats. And then imagine if the enemy turns up, you can face them with a fleet. What do they have to bring to fight your fleet? We can all hear that. It's what every defense salesman in history has said. But it's also true. That's the beauty of it. The trick, as I was taught by an uncle of mine who literally does, does sell refrigerators to Eskimos. I'm probably not supposed to call him that, uh, saying that now, but yeah, that's what he does in Canada. He sells refrigerator, uh, refrigeration units to people who live up in the very, very high, nor uh, high north of Canada. And, well, that's what he used to. He's retired. The best method of selling something is using the truth. People will smell a lie a mile away. But the truth, said sincerely and honestly, will floor them every time. And that is what Trion was known for. He was known for telling the truth. And he is succeeded by Henry Fairfax, who basically comes in and goes, Oh, thank you, Colonial Office. This is not really my area of expertise, but I'll try. Right. He'd been captain of, of Britannia, the Royal Navy Officer Training Establishment, in 1877 till 1882. And then after that, he went and, you know, assisted the Queen Victoria. He was a companion of the Order of Bath, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. He was considered more of an explorer in some ways, but he did take part uh, in the bombardment of Alexandria in command of HMS Monarch during the Anglo-Egyptian War. And he's appointed the Rear Admiral in 1885. On his return, he becomes Second Naval Lord. That caused an interesting debate on Twitter recently. I'll just go on a side note. Just for, there was a whole debate of, um, Winston Ch uh, of various people calling Winston Churchill a Sea Lord. He wasn't. He was a Lord of the Admiralty. The civilian lords. Sea lords are the naval officers. It was quite fun to watch that the, the going on Twitter and people not really uh, really getting confused about which was which. To the extent that there was me sitting there going, I have, w uh, I have obviously been talking to either phantoms or a very small minority for the last few years that this is still a, a topic of debate. But what was he most well known for? He's known for being an able political admiral. And Fairfax spends a large amount of time, a large amount of time, bedding in what Threon had done. And he goes around and he's, of course, in the same ship. But he's not quite the same. He's not as imposing a presence as Threon. Threon... Well, he, of course, is known as also as the Arkill Admiral, who takes part in the 1880, 
uh, eight naval maneuvers and various other things, and does really, really well. He's known as the CNC of the Mediterranean fleet, who manages to get himself, well, killed. by giving instructions and trying to expect his senior officers to think for themselves. I've done a video of that one, and it's... Basically, it's a classic thing of the Admiral is trying to get people to think for themselves, and he thinks he's got them in the level where they're going to think for themselves, but he's also going against, by that point, generations of naval training, which have been, you do not think for yourself, you do exactly what you're told by your boss. And... It's disasters like the loss of HMS Victoria and his drowning that leads to the Royal Navy developing into what it is, not just in World War I at some levels, but what it will become in World War II, where it is a very much a, a very professional Navy that is capable of dealing with the unexpected and adapting to it. But that is something the Royal Navy had achieved in the Napoleonic Wars, and then lose it in loses it in the peacetime and the period that sort of follows through most of the long nineteenth century, and then slowly have to regain it. And even before all that, he was known as being a thinking officer. He had a reputation of being a capable officer. So you send him out. You couple him with a ship which. Well, let's be honest. Looks pretty darn pretty. This is also big and very well crewed. You're making a major political statement, and that's what the British wanted to do. They built these ships. They built Nelson. <laughs> Sorry, pardon me. They built Nelson. They built Northampton. They built them with a the purpose of making a statement, of being presence, of being their distant station flagships. Both from the pragmatic perspective of having the space to do what was necessary in terms of diplomacy and peacetime, but also having the size and looking to have the firepower that their presence would be a deterrent for wartime. I, do you really want to go to war with that? More importantly, do you want to go to war with that, with him in command? That's a scary prospect. Now, I normally put a question at the end of my videos, and I'm going to put one here. And I'm going to, again, state that the, uh, the sci-fi video will be tomorrow. It is grown. It looks good. I'm enjoying that one. But the question is this. And really, I should change the picture for the question, because the question is more to do with the ship. How important do you think the ship is as a design to naval diplomacy. How important do you think the vessels you're using to to do naval diplomacy are? Let me put this another way. I talked in another video recently about presence versus deterrence and conflict management. Presence is best done with small vessels which are constantly there. So you have a constant low level constabulary presence. You know, things like the river class OPVs, they're doing a great job at the moment. Sloops in the 1920s, there were all sorts of vessels going around. And there's some really interesting discussions. I put in one of the sloop videos, I put a question of what do you think of sloops have stayed on instead of frigates as the phraseology? And lots of people going, oh, well, the sloops are. At the time, there were just as many sloops as there were frigates for the Royal Navy to really call upon. And because there are all sorts of other classes and there are all sorts of vessels going around which are under the sloop category. The thing was, they decide, when they're deciding, by the way, between sloops and frigates, they decide frigate is more of the anti-submarine warfare tool, whereas sloop is more of a general purpose. And with the coming age, they want their ships to be frigates for anti-submarine warfare, so they know that's what they're about, rather than sloops, which were general, pair, uh, general purpose and could be doing all sorts of things. 
uh, I, they felt that frigate was a more descriptive anti-submarine warfare because of how the name had become associated with it at the end of World War Two. So that's why sloops suddenly become called frigates. It's a brilliant piece of history, but originally they start off with sloops. And you have all sorts of small ships. But then when you want to do conflict management, i.e. you want to do deterrence, you want to turn up and go, look, okay, so, we've tried this nicely, the local diplomat has probably said something to you, and you're still being slow. Let's use that phrase. Slow on the uptake of what the meaning is. So here I am. I am the local station commander, or might be one of the other, uh, one of the senior captains who has a no or also has a big ship out there, because they're usually a couple of them. We're here, or well, I'm here with my large ship, to give you a rather polite but still very necessary introduction to the facts of life. We have many large vessels like this. They have many large guns. We have lots of very nice sailors who are really lovely and will happily spend a lot of money in your town and will help out with disaster relief and all sorts of things when we want them to. Please, come aboard, have dinner. See everything. See all the capabilities in front of you. And then decide whether you really want to keep pushing down the road you're on. You never, of course, say it quite so bluntly as that. You just give them a guided tour of all the guns. Maybe show them a, a nice gunnery drill. Everyone smartly fires every single gun. Just to make sure they understand that they all work. You know, no fake wooden models fitted here. You turn up the larger ship. You hope it does the job. If it doesn't do the job, and this is one of the advantages of turning up with a ship which isn't the station flagship, if you can, this is why HMS Birmingham is, brought, is sent to Tsingtao, arguably, rather than the county class, which was the station flagship of the China Station in 1939. Um, simply put, she goes. If necessary, the flagship shows up with an admiral aboard. Who will ex really explain that? And the Admiral might turn up with not just the flagship, but he might collect other ships along the way. So, I'd like, the question is, how important do you think the ship is to the message you're sending in naval diplomacy? How do you, important do you think what ship is, and what the ship is, matters? Right then, what have we come coming up? Oof. Well, I can tell you what's going to be tomorrow is going to be capital ships of science fiction, battle stars versus star destroyers, and I am literally grading science fiction stars, science fiction capital ships, as if they are university essays. Um, they're getting awarded first, two ones, thirds, you know, the usual thing. So far, no failures, but I haven't yet finished. I might add some more in. But also, I am noticing a distinct trend in that the ones designed to be the hero ships tend to be almost perfect in every single way to fit their situation. And the ones which are designed to be the bad guys, let's call them that phraseology, tend to have some pretty significant weaknesses once you look at them the properly. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and... Take care.